Hello and welcome to Footy Flashbacks. Has there ever been a better player? I'm not sure there has. My experience of watching footy dates back to only a fraction of the game's history. Actually, more than I'd care to admit. But wiser judges than me have accorded Lee Matthews the title of greatest ever player. He was squat, short-legged and barrel-chested. A rover who could mix it with the Giants. A pocket battleship. As a coach, he was decisive, thoughtful and a great communicator, both to his players and the public. Lethal, as he's universally known, played in four premiership teams and coached four. And these days, as an expert commentator, when he talks, everyone listens. For this special edition of Footy Flashbacks, Lethal Lee looks back on his life and times in footy. There's Lee Matthews, number three, going after the game. And it looks like a goal. However, out comes uh, Henry, picked up here by Lee Matthews. Looking for Matthews. Well, Lee, you've recently written a book. What's that taught you? Well, it's an interesting reflection on one's life, I guess, making yourself look back at the different phases of your life when you're very young, when you're a young adult. And when I look back now as a sort of 60-year-old, middle-aged grandfather, you know, it's a, it's a very different look. But uh, How do you perceive I, the footballer that played the game? I, what I perceive is that as the young footballer, I was that brutal and callous and driven egotistical, success-driven, call it what you like. I look back at that young person, so I don't like him much. Because <laughs> I just, I had a drive that, that, that scares me when I look back on it 30 years later. That's about, a, that's all I can say as a summary of it. Is that the thinking now of, a, of an old I man I think so, back? yeah, and I think that's the thing that comes through, that in different stages of our life, clearly we're the same person, but we look at situations very differently. I wrote a book with Mike Sheehan at the end of my playing days in 1986. Now, when I look back on the pre-86 days now, compared to what I did then as a 33-year-old, you have a very different perception on the people around, the influence of people around, like the influence of John Kennedy Senior, my first coach. The, the more I go in life, the more I understand just that subtle influence he had on me and my thinking about competition and winning and losing and all those impersonal he, aspects of it. He was a very moral man and yet Absolutely, he yeah. encouraged the young Lee Matthews to be brutal and callous and... Well, yeah, that's probably uh, true. I mean, the, the competitive urge that some you know, competitive sportsmen have to different degrees, it's, it's kind of how far does your competitive urge push you into areas that aren't you? Like, I've always regarded my whole life I'm a fairly passive person, but as an on-field footballer, I was pretty brutal and callous because that seemed to be the chameleon that was needed in me to survive out on the field in that environment. Well, 1971, let's get to it, the yeah. Barry Cable incident. Yeah, yeah. How do you look back on that? Well, I jumped the footy and crunched Cage in the head with the forearm and you look back on it and think, well, you know, a bit like, what did I do that for kind of situation? I mean, no, that, yeah, I look back on it with some disgust and embarrassment, to be honest. And the same with the Neville Bruns Yeah, saga. there's a number of times that in my... It's taken a long through. time to get to these, Lee, yeah, by the way. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I say to people, I played 332 games. I don't think I'd knock out someone out every one of them, but unfortunately there was enough along the career that, you, you know, yeah, I'm embarrassed about that. Um, the, uh, what would you call it, the, uh, the untoward and probably unnecessarily rough stuff. Have you ever spoken to Neville Bruns about it? No, not really. Uh, I haven't ran in. K Barry Cable, I've seen heaps over the, over the years, but I just, in terms of just no particular reason, but I haven't been at the same place. Well, like the last pl place where I was with Neville Bruns at the same time was at the county court <laughs> when I was appealing my conviction after that offence. Because obviously that offence went to the courts. Mm. There's um, a real stigma. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it was just, I mean, we've been, all been involved in footy a long time. It's the only one at top level that's got to the courts. Um, but that particular one did. What would you say to Neville Bruns now? Ah, uh, sorry. You know, did the wrong thing. There's no, you know, you kind of, it's a bit like you do the crime, you do the time. There's a bit of an element of that. And again, I, uh, you, you, can, you can only yeah, sort of like apologise in, uh, in a sense because I feel, yeah, uh, embarrassed about something like that. You talked about how you've changed. Uh, is footy still your life? Yeah, yeah, no, footy, footy, I'm one of those fortunate people that, the, my passion, which has been there from virtually the day I was born in the, in the football, has also become my livelihood pretty much 
for my whole life. I mean, the last time I worked a job outside football was probably 1982. Oh, but you do those divine homes ads? Uh, well, that's been much more recent, but that's that's an adjunct. But no, I, I'm still working a normal nine to five job. Mm. I, I work for the Victorian Dairy Industry Authority. But so since 1982, the last 30 years, I've worked in footy. So that's like working at your hobby, whether it's playing or coaching or, or doing the media work. And yet it's been your whole life, isn't it? Because you were, what, 10 or 11 years of age when you wore yep. your first Victoria jumper? Yeah, well, as a little fellow in the Victorian under 14s, as a, uh, as, as a what would have been a 13, like, 13 year old. But I mean, I, I started playing club level footy as a 12 year old in the Chelsea under 15s. So I guess there's only been uh, a handful of years since then that uh, you haven't been involved in a club most winter, winter weekends. And by 16, you were playing for Hawthorne? I went to Hawthorne as a 16-year-old. I had one year with Chelsea Seniors as a 16-year-old, mm -hmm. and then I went to Hawthorne at the end of that year. So mm -hmm. I, basically, I, my birthday's in March, so I was uh, 17 in March of my first year at Hawthorne. And at 18, you were a father. So did yes, you, did you yes. kind of miss your teenage years, do you think? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I missed being the young single adult, probably, but that was probably a good thing, because in terms of my sport... You know, like, there's no doubt when you're sort of married, you've got children, it settles you down. You're living a different life, clearly. So, mm. in fact, that was probably a very beneficial thing uh, for my uh, sporting career. Up it goes now. Ball having a go. There's Lethal Lee going for a shot at goals. He doesn't miss. There. Beautiful goal. The nickname Lethal you would have got from yeah. Lou, I guess. Lou Richards, yes. And that was that after the, the cable incident? Uh, well, it's probably in 1971, I guess, when I, uh, when I got picked for Victoria for the first time, and obviously that cable incident happened that mm. year. But I guess it, about that time was, was uh, Lou, as he did, look for something that rhymed with Lee, and lethal <laughs> rhy uh, rhy rhymed with Lee. So the lethal um, sort of tag was, uh, uh, was, was, was popped on me about that 71, 72. But just as appropriate was the nickname Barney. Yeah. Which was given to you by Peter Hudson? Yeah, well, that was very different. Uh, yeah, um, whereas when I was playing Hawthorne Reserves and Peter Hudson, great Hawthorne full forward, was waiting in the stands to play the seniors, watching the reserves. And, Look at that little Lee Matthews over there. Doesn't he run like Barney Rubble out of the Flintstones? So everyone who I, even to this day, anyone that I know through Hawthorne will always call me Barney because that was my, was my Hawthorne nickname. There is a St Kilda connection I and mean, there's a photo of you at a pie night with Carl yeah, Dittrich? Yeah, as, a, as 1964 that was. Yeah, well, 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 Chelsea obviously just being down the mm. Mornington Peninsula, before mm. Zoning came in, it was most likely because uh, St Kilda at Moorabbin by then, that the young people, for, the young guys from the Peninsula would more likely go and play for St Kilda. And you, they sent you some money, the Saints? Uh, well, yeah, when I got into the Victorian under 15, under 14 schoolboys team, they might have sent... Seven pounds? Seven pounds, yeah. I think there was a letter that said seven pounds. Uh, but then zoning came in a year or two later and we, I was zoned to Hawthorne. So, you know, there's a fair chance if it hadn't been for zoning, well, probably would have gone, had a go at St Kilda. Well, let's have a look at the 1971 grand final. It was a tough one, wasn't it? Yeah, that was when the rules and regulations governing the game were much, much more uh, lenient than they, uh, than they certainly are 40 years later. Well, here's the 71 grand final. Peter Hudson, four goals to go to break the record, but more important, kicking Hawthorne towards a premiership. The kick's on its way. It's a beautiful kick. He's put it through. He's put it through. Injury has been occurred now for two or three minutes, and it looks too bad for him to continue. Lee Matthews with the ball. There's Bob Murray there, number six. Puts a skip in. Puts it on its way. It's a long kick. It's going to be close. Put me in it close. It's through. Can't take it, picked up here by Matthews. Lost it just as quickly. Theodore dives on it. An umpire shields indicating a free kick could be taken by Lee Matthews of Hawthorne. But Day picks it up and drives it out towards the half forward flank of Lee Matthews, who takes a fine mark. Was about to play on, but steadies and goes back. On comes Matthews. Kicks it along. It's down towards Kevin Neal. He falls just as they're about to take the mark. Three or four times now, his inability to carry the injury has been proven. His opponent's got lazy kicks. We saw Matthews take a fine mark on the wing position there. He now drives it in towards centre-half forward where Barry Lawrence, with nobody on him, takes an easy chest mark. Well, it comes here. In St Kilda's scoring zone. Theodore now tries a hand pass. Taken by Manzi. Manzi snaps. He's put it through. 149 goals up. Kicking to the scoreboard end. He kicks. There's 
no shout off that. We've got to congratulate him. He's equal Bob Pat's uh, record in one season. There's a siren ending the second quarter with the scoreboard at halftime reading in the 1971 grand final. Hawthorne 4-4-28, St Kilda 4-6-30. John Bonney puts it on its way. It's swinging around. It's close. points the difference Matthews always a long way out 65 yards there's Hudson in the goal square Neil behind him Lawrence in front of him it's a big kick don't tell me he's put it through oh beautiful a fantastic kick it's a short kick going in towards Lee Matthews oh over the back goes Moran Lee Matthews has got a trip with a free kick and gets this one too the St Kilda player down there it's uh, Stewie Trott Trotty got unloaded in the third quarter as Matthews takes his kick down forward. They set themselves. Hudson is in that lot. There's a chance for Stevenson. He runs into a heap of trouble, as you saw. Taken by Lawrence. Can't get his kick. Picked up by Martello. He's been manhandled. Taken by Kitty. Difference ball escapes him, however. Who comes little Crimmins? Crimmins has it, he's running into an open goal. He kicks, he's put it through. It's his second. Hawthorne, three goals in three minutes in the final quarter. He's 12 yards out, directly in front. He kicks. Hawthorne are in front. Hawthorne are in front. And forward it goes, a chance for plays. Couldn't quite get to it. Kitty's in there. Kitty picks up, he screws around, he snaps. It's close, I can tell you. Kitty's oh! kicked three in this last quarter. He sends it back to the wing position. Siren goes. Siren goes. Hawthorne, our premiers, 1971. Hawthorne, our premiers, and the final scoreboard here reads Hawthorne 12, 10, 82. St Kilda, 11, 9. 75. Oh, the post is broken. Matthews hit it and broke the point post. Oh, talk about a he-man. How was that? He split it right down in half. <laughs> Lee, we live in cynical times. Had that post been tampered with? <laughs> well, apparently. So, I mean, uh, I mean, that point post in incident was great image building stuff. So, I don't really like telling the true story, uh, Neil, in all the. Uh, in all honesty, but I, I, I think there'd been a new top bit put on the point post. And and I really didn't hit the point post all that hard, to be honest. I stood on the boundary umpire's foot. That was the uh, that was the main damage. But I and I didn't even know I'd bumped into it at the time. That's how little contact there really was. But obviously the top wobbled off. And I was in the rooms after the game and said to the head trainer, I've got a bit of a lump on my elbow. I don't know where this came from. And he said that was probably when you broke the point post. So that was the first I knew of it. Amazing. Played footy for a long time, but... Even my grandson tells everyone, Grandpa broke the point post. <laughs> the broken point post is the big image building thing in my, my life as it's turned out, Neil. Matthews runs into the post. Oh, Come on, Matthews. Mental touch. What are you, a marshmallow? It's all up here, <laughs> mate. Oh, what? Oh, oh, I'll put you in, Lee. I'll put you in. Yeah! Lee, 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 Lee. There was a gym at Hawthorne, I remember. Did you use it very often? No, not really. I mean, you do. You ever tempted with the roids or any of that stuff? Yeah, well, no, see, this is interesting. In the 70s, and when you talk about the, the, the history of the game, in the 80s is when the gym program started to come into uh, into normal being. Um, and I, but I really missed that. I mean, finished in 85, so I never really got into heavy weight programs. Certainly by the by the latter stage of my career, I was trying to lighten off, not 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 get heavier. But they weren't illegal. I'm... I'm, I'm Certain that it was odd. There was a few players in the 80s that popped the steroids as an aid to making themselves bigger, stronger. 
But that was the era where that all came in. It wasn't illegal. It wasn't again. There was no rules that said you, could, you couldn't do it. Um, but that was the, the start of football's uh, body sculpting period, I reckon, in the 80s. What was your best position? You seemed to play so much of your footy in the forward pocket. Yeah. I think you kicked 915 goals. Yeah. The most by anyone not full forward. Yeah. My best position was centre-half forward, but I never grew um, tall enough to play there. I played in under 15s, I played centre half forward. That was my best year in footy. But so, I, you can, I, so you can control the half well, control I mean, the forward I, line? You say what was, I mean, I just never got tall enough to play centre, uh, centre half forward, but I was kind of, I mean, what I ended up becoming. You'd like to play centre half forward? Well, you know, it's a bit, bit of a hypothetical because I never got tall enough. So basically, you, be, you became, you know, I was a small player, obviously, mm. you know, 178 centimetres, pretty small for football standards, but I was able to, in the days when you used to have the first rover and the second rover, um, I would uh, I would spend, I don't know, depending upon which way the wind was blowing, mm. uh, part of the time on the ball and a lot of the time deep in the forward line. And I like playing deep in, in the forward line. And, um, so I guess I was a goal-kicking um, midfielder. You'd really. back yourself against most people in a marking contest, even if they were taller, because of I, your body. Yeah, I reckon when I was in my prime, you know, I'd say this, I guess, not too humbly, I could beat anyone one-on-one. -on -one. If I couldn't beat them in the air, I could beat them second effort on the ground. So... When I was in my prime, I reckon I could end up getting the ball against anyone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, because you could anchor those legs well, there. Well, I, I, yeah, I could you either could mark against them. the little blokes, the little back pockets. Mm. If they played taller people on me, then uh, then I reckon I could bring the ball to the ground and beat them at ground level. So that that was probably how I... That I was very happy playing deep forward then. Yeah. You got the most votes um, in the Brownlow for a bloke who never won the medal. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think the Brownlow is credible, seeing that so many great players haven't won it? Well, no, no, it's only, you can only win it one year. I mean, great players have become great players because they've been great over a long period of time. Um, whereas you only have need one good year, in a sense, to win the Brownlow, and it's the, it's the most votes any one year. Which one do you value? Which award do you think says uh, the, well, Lee, the Lee Matthews Trophy, you know? Well, no, probably not. I mean, the, the two biggest acknowledgement I've ever got is probably, and later, later on, I got acknowledged as the player of the century, according to the Herald Sun writers. That was a gigantic honour. There's, a bit, there's yeah. a bit of sweet story there, isn't there, with the, when you well, got that Well, so, yeah, and the same day that that was announced, or that I was told, uh, my dad was in hospital suffering from pneumonia, and I was going to hospital with mum, and I was going to tell him, and just prior to he had arrived, he'd had a heart attack and died a couple of hours later, so I never got a chance to actually tell him the news. So that was that was a little bit bittersweet. Um, he was that, a low-key character, your dad, but he, oh, yeah, he would have been very proud. I mean, he would have been at every football game we ever played. Once I started playing footy at the you know, AFL seniors or VFL seniors, mum stopped going. She just got too nervous. But dad would have seen almost every game of footy I played ever since you know, I was 12. Um, so was that happened. very yeah. proud of you, even, even oh, when well, you disgraced so. yourself? Oh, well... Did he, yeah, well, did I guess, you say, I don't, Lee, that wasn't, wasn't the right thing? No, I don't think he ever actually said the words, but I think he probably thought that, yeah. I think Dad... I mean, Dad... Dad yeah, I don't think Dad uh, was, would have been sort of defending... Mum would have defended me no matter what. See, the morality of sport is a really difficult uh, discussion, you know, like the, the actual urge to win. How far do you push that? I was asked... John Eels, the rugby league great. Asked rugby me, union. A rugby yeah. union great. A few years ago, he did a book. Asked me a simple question. He said, Lee, what wouldn't you do to win? And the only thing I could think to say is I don't think I'd kill anybody. Mm. And when the, 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 the length you'd go to to win is a bit frightening, really. It becomes such an obsession. And many of us, I think, very moral men have suffered from that obsession. Well, some of us are obsessed with money. I remember a huge headline on the front of the Sporting Globe, the pink paper, yeah. saying uh, Lee Matthews, 40000 a year. And it was yeah. like this kind of... Yeah. Wow, we've pushed the forty thousand dollar a yep. year barrier. Yep. Got off at seventy five thousand by uh, by uh, Essendon at the time, but uh, the, the, the clearance what, what rules. What year was that? Well, it would have been in that seventy eight, seventy nine at the end oh. of seventy eight. But you couldn't. There was no automatic clearances, so I don't know how the hell you would ever got there. Because mm. uh, Hawthorne didn't, and I never wanted to go. And I, I guess Hawthorne offered me sufficient not to think about leaving. Because I mean, you, you come attached to your club, it becomes home. It would have made it very different if you'd gone to Essendon. That rivalry, 83, 84, 85, would have been interesting yeah. if you are on the other side, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it would have been different. Well, it was never going to happen, let's face it. But, yeah, that, 
83, 84, 85, when it turned out that, that we played uh, Essendon, Hawthorne, Essendon in three consecutive grand finals. And uh, the, the ability of the two teams changed enormously over those three that three-year period. Let's have a look at some highlights from the 1983 grand final. 110,000 people roar as umpire Neville Nash comes in to bounce the ball for the start of the 1983 grand final from Melbourne Cricket Ground between Hawthorne and Essendon. Over it goes to Brereton. There's a chance for Matthews now. Coming into meet it is Rodney Eads, showing a lot of pace. There's a pass. It's all right. And a goal to Bloodreach. And Hawthorne get the first goal on the board at the six and a half minute mark. Kick to It'll be a free kick to Watson. The ball short. There's a go for Renee Kink. The incredible Hulk. And the incredible Hulk. The ex Collingwood star. And he's hoping for a goal. It's coming around nicely. It's a beautiful goal. He allowed for the win. The goal to uh, Essendon and to Renee Kink. So it's one goal, six points. Essendon to Hawthorne. One goal, two, eight points. Madden got the tap down to Brereton, a snap well covered by Watson. Spinning out of the pack is Matthews, there's strength for you. And look at the champ go as he fires at the goals, he won't make the distance. He overruns the ball, backing up well as Williams. He's in a bit of trouble, he's grabbed. Here's a go now for Kennedy, have a shot at goal. And he's put it through for goal. That's their second. Up the centre wing. Oh, what a mark. That's Merritt. Who plays on. Up to half forward, Danaher and Mew. Yes, what a mark again. Oh, that's oh, a bit hard. That is ridiculous. unbelievable. Unbelievable. Absolutely ridiculous. What more can he do except stand on the mark? He's goal. And Judge had already kicked the goal before that. There's the kick. So it's the same result. A goal to Hawthorne. And Hawthorne now move on to three goals, four, 22 to Essendon, two goals, 12 points. On a judge. Judge into full forward. Matthews is there. Luther Lee has not had too many kicks in this first quarter. He kicked the goal with one of his previous four. And that was the free kick that was originally intended for Terry Wallace. Matthews, 30 metres out. And a goal. Chance for little Loveridge. He goes down. There's the side around the first quarter. And uh, we see the fine, uh, quarter time scores in the 1983 grand final. Hawthorne, five goals. 636 points to Essendon, three goals. 18 points. So we start the second quarter now of the 83 grand final. Hawthorne leading, but only by 18 points. Underground pass to Vanderhaar. a chance to score the hand pass comes over to Lovridge another one coming back to Matthews and can Matthews kick this goal it's a left footer but he should have uh, well it should have, have given the hand pass. pass and Tuck has a pot shot at the goals but will it make the distance it'll be a goal there's Michael Tuck kicking his first goal and it couldn't come at a better time and it's with Hawthorne not able to capitalise on it so far they might this time as Matthews takes the mark. Lee Matthews has kicked two goals, as has the Essendon skipper Terry Danaher. Matthews some 35 to 40 metres out from goal. What's he done with that one? Judging by the crowd, it's a goal. So three goals for Matthews and a very valuable one for Hawthorne. On the Mew. Streaming downfield, looking for Matthews. And he's getting old, he's about 33 years of age. I don't know how he got up that high. He had a help from the, from the <laughs> shoulder of Gary, that's, that's how. That's uh, the grand final mark so far, isn't it? I'll guarantee when he got up that high, he was saying to himself, how the heck am I going to get down now? He's kicked three. He's missed that one, has he? Or is it three? It's a goal. Certainly deserved the goal as Matthews brings up his fourth and Hawthorne's eight goal. 8-8-56 eight, eight, to Essendon, four goals, 24. I think it's best summed up uh, by saying that is what leadership is all about. Uh, you, you lead by example. As on, the, on the replay, Matthews, not a doubt that uh, he was the only player that was going to get that ball. A hand pass to Russell Green out there at half forward. A long kick towards the goal. Green. 
Hites for the long kick up there into the goal square. Burn in the front, Puzzy. He's got the mark. Oh, they're running right over the top of them now. And they uh, look to me as if they're a little bit rattled, Essendon, and uh, I think the lack of grand final experience is uh, starting to tell at the moment. Well, they've thrown players around everywhere too, Lou, and, uh, you know, Van der Haar's now on the half-back line, popping into the forward pocket, admittedly copying, you know, is a forward pocket player. Their, their back line players of all, you know, just about everyone bar Walsh has been moved. Looks for the tall timber, Byrne and Knights. Walsh, one hand. hit the Knights. What was that for, Bob? Push in, it in, in the, the back. back. I think he might have helped a little bit, but it was there all the same, but the siren's gone. Knights will, of course, have the shot. Of course, he started his career as a defender, and defenders, of course, aren't the best kicks. That one's the exception that proves the rule, I guess. As Peter Knights puts it through for a goal just prior to half-time, and that'll give the Hawks a lift, I'm certain. Knights' his first goal in at half-time at Hawthorne, 12 10 82, Essendon 4 1 25. Good kick from Wallace, looking for Matthews. Heard, oh, beautiful one-hander, just not uh, completing it enough. Matthews, a shot at goal. Oh, that's a gem! Lethal's done it! Five goals to Matthews. And that was unbelievable because Shane Heard almost took a superb mark. One-handed, and Matthews pinched it and kicked a goal. Well, how, how do you feel from an Essendon point of view now, Lou, when uh, you see Shane Heard juggle the ball? Bradbury came on the scene. And that's a remarkable goal from Matthews from that position. And we've mentioned a couple of times, you lead by example. Matthews has done just that. Steadies for another one, another long shot. Is it Jim to Russell Green? 30 metres away and made no attempt to get to the kick of the play. Well, Matthews got one. He never gets who it is, he's gone again. Oh, golly, I don't know about this one. Oh, what do you reckon, Bob, about that? I don't think Lee's too concerned. So that's four reports. And there's no doubt about Matthews going for goal number six. And that's why he's the champion. As well, don't 15 metres. This really makes him the champion that he is. Uh, when the big occasions uh, come along, Pete, he just lifts himself right to the top, doesn't he? Five goals to Matthews and a chance to make it number six. This looks dangerous, a long shot at goal up there to burn and Miles, he's put it through. A magnificent goal, and what a pass the Bombers are getting at the moment. Here are dear. Not like Tuck not to get straight no. up, is it? Matthews takes the mark in the meantime, so Buccanara down in the first few minutes, and Michael Tuck now down. So Hawthorne certainly getting their injury worries, and they've had a couple of players reported. That will be a hip out. A free kick going to Essendon's uh, Cameron Clayton. Tuck getting back up. Seems to be OK. McCarthy, the knock on is there by Merritt, opens it up for Williams. Oh, Robertson, top one, but comes through beautifully. Well done, Colin Robertson, that was guts. Wallace, up to Matthews, who picks it up, yes. And the mark played to the Hawthorne skipper. And Matthews, about 55 metres out from goal, has already kicked six goals. And uh, played a great game too, but he's had plenty of friends out there. Not many weak players. I can't find one weak player in the Hawthorne lineup at the moment. As the kick by Matthews. Let's see the result. Cover the distance. And it's through for one point. It's the start of the final quarter of the 83 Grand Final from the Melbourne Cricket Ground and the crowd in excess of 110,000. As umpire Kevin Smith comes in to pass the ball. Hawthorne leading 114 to 27. In front of Simon Madden. As a matter of fact, Bob, he's tried pretty hard all day. He's done oh. really well on the right. Gave the wrong hand pass. And there we see Ludridge firing the goals. And I think he's put it through. He has. Yes, the goal. Yeah, well, I can't. He's probably their best player, and uh, there he goes for a hand pass to the wrong man, and they score a goal. Lee Matthews has kicked six so far on the game. It's a long kick by Tuck. Doesn't make the distance. Burn in front's got the mark. Just coming on the ground, replacing airs, and, of course, that's how things are going for Hawthorne at the moment. Burn going for goal number three, and he's put it through for a goal. So we see the difference now, 101 points. And a good mark to Copping. Well, why weren't Essendon doing this all day? It's too late now, the horse is bold. It's no good closing the gate now, Peter. Copping from 20 metres out has put through a goal. That's Steve Copping's first. Well, there's the siren of the Hawthorne of from 1883. And a fine effort. There's their coach, Alan Jeans. And what a happy man. It couldn't have happened to a nicer guy.
out of Stephen Phillips. Thank you, Peter. With me, I've got Lee Matthews. Lee, what's the feeling like? Well, it's funny, you know, I hate to be cocky, but written by that much sometimes spoils it, you know, I, because, you know, you know it's coming and that, you know, they're sort of getting used to it the whole quarter, but our fellas today, they put their heart and soul into the game and just ran the fellas off their feet and, you know, I was just proud to lead them. The Hawthorne uh, side obviously was steeled for this game and yet it didn't really eventuate into the hard place that it might have been. Uh, I never expected it to be any sign of blood, Buzz. I mean, it was a, it's going to be a tough match. Yes, we're a good, tough side. Today, just we played so much better. We played pretty much as our peak and if you do that, well, we'd always be hopeful that we can win a premiership. But it's such a, you know, there's so many things can go wrong. It's just fantastic to actually be there. Congratulations, captain of the premiership side for the Thanks, first time, Lee Matthews. Sure. thinking you'd just lost the grand final or you'd just finished your career? I think the finishing the career. I mean, we'd lost the grand final about a quarter out. I mean, it was only a matter of how, how lot, much we were going to get beaten for. So it wasn't a close loss on the siren. So I guess when I was going off the field and you know you're going off the field for the last, last time, it's that, like, all I wanted to do from the time I can remember was want to play football and this was the last time I would ever play it. That uh, It's kind of like dying, part of your dies. Maybe it's a good part of me died because <laughs> that was a dark part of my soul, I think, Neil. But, yeah, that, it was a, just unbelievably sad. But it's amazing. I, about half hour later, in the rooms after the game, Dad came in, actually, and my, and my older brother. And I had this enormous sense of don't have to battle the young blokes anymore. Like, I just don't have to fight any longer. So, you know, that in, a, in a way, you, uh, the old body had, was wearing out com compared to my prime. So... I didn't have any more football left in me, but at the time when you walked off the field for the last time, you know, incredibly sad moment. You've probably looked back at that a few times, lots yeah. of times over yeah. the years. You, were you always comfortable seeing yourself teary-eyed in front of 100,000 people? No, that didn't worry me. I mean, what you asked, what you asked. I was just, that's what I was feeling at the time. Had you thought about the next stage of your life? No, not really. I mean, I'm, I had been, I'd been asked uh, like a month or two before, was I interested in getting involved with Collingwood the following year as an assistant coach to Bob Rose? And I said, I don't want to even think about it until we've finished our, our footy. So um, after that, fairly quickly, there was some interest from uh, Jeff Ellison at the Swans uh, uh, just shortly after. Well, uh, but yeah, that all happened fairly quick. fast cars? No, nah, never, never got any more than a couple of uh, chats in Melbourne. Uh, so yeah. But Collingwood was already having a talk. Well, team. Collingwood were already uh, already interested, and uh, and that's eventually eventually what happened. I could now go to Victoria Park without breaking into a cold sweat <laughs> because it was a very scary place as an opposition player. So going there to work and be part of uh, part of Collingwood uh, it was just a great part of my How life. How different was the culture, if there was such a thing at Collingwood at that time, from yeah. where you'd been in Hawthorne, which was... The only, the only the thing I can club. say to that question is that the Collingwood was based more on individual people rather than the job that they did. Like, for instance, if the CEO uh, left at Hawthorne, you could virtually just replace the CEO. At Collingwood, the, you know, the, the, um, it, it just seemed to be more based around people. Now, I based that on Alan McAllister, the way he was chairman, Graham Allen, who was football manager, I guess the way I was as, as coach. That's, apart from that, football clubs behind the scenes are really, you know, are really all, all the same, really. Champion players don't often succeed as coaches. Um, how did you change yourself, or what did you have to bring to your thinking, and what did you need to change at Collingwood? Um, well, I guess all I did really was take what the Hawthorne, let's face it, Collingwood got me there because the Hawthorne would be, were successful at the time. So I, in a sense, what, all my thinking about what should be done, I guess, was based on things that were probably being done at Hawthorne and the way Alan Jeans wanted his team to play. So I, I was almost just a copycat, really. I just went there and tried to institute most of the principles that seemed to have been successful at Hawthorne at, uh, um, at Collingwood. That was my initial way I read about my, uh, my coaching. The pathway to the 1990 grand final was a, was a yep. treacherous path. I mean, yep. you, you nearly bailed out in the, one of the first finals when yep. Uh, yep. Peter Simmons hit the well, post. Well, it was a draw, yeah. had a draw yep. and then you yep. played again the next week. Um, when did you realise that the club could win the grand final? Uh, the, I know it was about 25-minute mark of the last quarter. Tony Shaw came in board on his left foot, 
drilled it, chipped it into Damien Monkhurst around centre half forward. Damien went back and kicked the goal. I think we're now eight goals in front, and it's approaching the 30 minute mark. That was when I thought we could win the grand final. Would that be one of the best feelings of your life? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that moment, the moment in sport where you kind of, it's not that we're probably going to win, it's we now can't lose. In other words, we have won, not the, the possibility of losing has been eradicated. That moment is is the, just the, I've never been able to experience that exhilaration, euphoria, euphoria, whatever you want to call it, outside those sporting moments, because it's so concentrated. And it's all make-believe in the sense. We know sports make-believe, but uh, it, it, yeah, I can still remember it, how it, I felt at that moment, yeah. Is it make-believe? What is make-believe in? It's a make-believe contest, uh, in a sense. Uh, I mean, it's not... That's why we all love it. It's not real life when it's all boiled down. You know, we like to put ourselves on the line, and that's what footy fans do when they go to the footy. They put their emotions on the line for the day if they care, if they really care about their team. Mm. Well, Essen supporters put their emotions on the line watching anything relating to the 1990 yeah. Grand Final. But um, let's have a look at a few highlights from Collingwood's greatest day. Hamilton's kick, the drop punt, across the face. Salmon! Ripped all over. The football was Paul Salmon's name and he marks Salmon directly in front. Shoots for goal. It's close. It's home. Eston have got the first goal. No one can break clear. A tap to the advantage of Dacos. Look at the gather. The right foot snap. This is a miraculous kick. Unbelievable. Peter Dacos has posted Collingwood's first goal for the day. Kick into the forward pocket. Brown will keep it in, run into an open goal and put it through. Collingwood get their second. Anderson's left foot kick is wide over the head of Van der Haar. Makes good ground, runs out of room. There's the siren first term in the 1990 Grand Final. Collingwood, 2-5, 17, Lee and 2-2, quarter. And we have a brawl on the siren of Eric. Well, we saw him plenty of attention as Kelly. And we thought this had happened very early on, and now they're not, they're not mucking around these guys. And usually this does happen early on in a Grand Final, not at the quarter time break. further ahead. He goes. His first. The ball breaks free. It's all Collingwood. Grasiska hits towards goal. A good looking kick. He's done it. The umpire not picking them all up. Well, Denner has gone for the hand pass to Ezard and Russell's got him. He's lost it. Oh, 50 minutes. Scott Russell, a gimme goal to send the Magpies further ahead. No mark, touched away. Now Kickett gets his right oh. foot to the ball. It's fair oh. through. Oh. Miraculous goal by Kickett. And the Bombers come back. Russell plays on quickly. The centre half boards a player on his own bowling. It will that be 50 metres because that was a late tackle. 50. Starsevich is going to leave the ground. McGuan shoots the goal, and these pies are hot. A 
Russell picks it up, heads in towards the pocket. Over the head of Thompson it goes. Dacos, this is where he's at his best. The master. And kicks it to the front of the square. Oh, nearly Brown. Eston under pressure. Brown will kick a goal. And if that doesn't bring the roof off the MCG, nothing will. Well, earlier I complimented the Collingwood forwards, in particular Brown, on the pressure they've exerted on those Essendon backs. 30 more minutes for Collingwood to break a 32-year drought. And a quiet day by his standards, still looking for his first goal. They desperately want it. And he's hit the post. The skipper gives it to Barwick. On to Banks. Dennis Banks caught. Back to Barwick. Doug Barwick shoots and goals. Pulling what a home. The Pies are home. Two and a half minutes left. Monkhurst from 40 metres out. The kick looks pretty good. Up go the fans. It's another goal. Well, as I mentioned, that's his third goal. Damien Monkhurst. Most improved player last year. You see there Lee Matthews coming down. He realises the team have won. A smile on his face. Celebrations begin. Alan McAllister and Lee Matthews. Tony Shaw. He's seen his brother play and lose grand finals. And now he is the champion. Absolutely fantastic down here. The feeling is absolutely sensational. All the Collingwood players are around now. And they are happy. Well, they've worked so hard. Lee Matthews' rebuilding program is waving to the crowd and with him is his inspirational skipper, Tony Shaw. And he's been on this stand before, ladies and gentlemen, never as the coach of a winning team, and it happens to be Collingwood, the coach, Lee Matthews. Looking at that, do you remember that, that moment? Well, it was. I reckon that was as stressful a day as I've had in the coaching box because the week before we got beaten by 80 points odd by the Kangaroos at Victoria Park. And if you get thrashed at Victoria Park at Collingwood, that's not a good thing. And then we went and played this game against Melbourne and I reckon we were six goals behind about ten minutes in. So, yeah, it was a pretty stressful day that I happened to be mic'd up in the box. Uh, how long did you coach Collingwood for? Well, 10 years. 10 years. Um, of course, after 1990, we won the premiership. Anything said within 24 hours of a premiership, there should be a moratorium on. <laughs> and for me, I was appointed coach for life by Alan McAllister, as we know, and I got sacked five years later. Yeah. And Alan went not long after too, so 
Yeah, so that was, that was, but I, the Collingwood was a fantastic place to be involved for my decade, but you know, you, you, the time comes. After you, you spent three years out in the media with yeah, us. Yeah. Why did you go back into coaching? I had no, com- no interest in coaching in 19, as it was 1996. I was able to go and work in the media, but then one year was into two, two, it was into three. But uh, Fremantle actually uh, spoke to me about their job about three quarters of the way through uh, 98. I wasn't interested. I did the courtesy, had a chat with them, but that was it. And, but then Brisbane uh, made contact. Said they're going to pay you half a million to coach them if you're interested. That really pricked my ears a bit. <laughs> you had pretty much success from the start. Well, we had an amazing 1999. We, uh, I mean, they, Collingwood, uh, uh, the Lions, of course, you know, sort of the history, got into the top four in 96, mm. finals in 97. Their, their chain of command fell apart in 1998. That was mm. So they were a great club to take over. The first thing I said to the players was a simple principle. Hey, coaches coach, players play, managers manage. That's how we're going to run our organisation. Wasn't a whole lot of player leadership group involvement back in those early days. <laughs> um, and uh, but but so it was a great environment because the, they'd seen what had happened when they had let their chain of command fall apart. So everyone was a really willing to actually okay, let we play our role, we help each other with with our other role. So it was a, but going outside Victoria was the big thing, of course. I mean, I'd lived shifted about 20 k's in my whole life up until I shifted to another state. Good move. You're oh, still there. It ended up being a, being a terrific man because what happened at the Lions was just extraordinary. And Michael Voss was just the most magnificent captain as an on-field performer, as a leader of the group. But we had a lot of other players in the same category. Give us a few words about each of them. Jonathan Brown? Well, Jonathan Brown was only the boy. He was only the 19-year-old in, in 2001. So he, but he was a boy, sorry, a man at 20. Mm. John Kennedy used to say to me, you could be a man at 20 and a boy at 30. <laughs> Many are. Simon Black? Well, he was a young player too at that stage. I mean, that, that, in that, at that premiership era, they were just the young kids, you know, sort of playing along in a way. What um, about Alistair Lynch? Just an, a, an amazingly big, powerful athlete. We had the really bad chronic fatigue in the, mm. in the midnight. And he had after effects of that the whole time we coached him. So you always had to mm. be careful with him. But as a full forward, he, you could actually... He was the ogre. The, you could drop the ball on his head 15 metres out. That was our get-out kick. Mm. And Lynch, he was so strong, if he didn't mark it, the ball would normally drop in close and that gave our little crumbing players, Craig McRae, a good chance of getting it. So so we had all, just a, whether it be Marcus Ascroft, Sean Hart, uh, Chris and Brad Scott, Justin Leppich. I mean... Jason we, Ekermanis. Well, Jason was a wonderful player. I mean, I never thought of Jason as, what would you call, one of the leaders of the side, but he was a fantastic, I call them consultants, they actually help you win games of footy. He was just a magnificent uh, on-field performer. You there? Go and tell Acho, run to the front of Lynchy. Run to the front, front not the to the back. At the full of the ball, Acho. That's it. Yeah, yeah get out there. Tell him it's about five minutes to go. It's about five minutes to go. We haven't got time to tell him now. You there? We need, we need a sweeper in our forward 50 stoppages. We haven't asked uh, Jason for the purposes of this what he thinks of you, but Michael Voss said you're a hard man to get to know back then. Yeah, and no, I didn't... You distance take, yourself yeah, from I the didn't, place? Just, I think that's just what I... That was just my natural personality. I don't think I was... Um, um, I didn't coach on friendship. I mean, I, that's what I mean. I, you look back... I probably coach more on the John Kennedy model in a sense. I mean, you, you've got to communicate, obviously, that's the issue. But, I, but you know, the, there was some advantage that I had probably with the, uh, what's the word, the, the aura. Yeah. But the downside of that is that players weren't necessarily able to come and, I don't know, what's the word? When did Chit-chat. The, <laughs> when did the aura grow? Oh, I don't know. When idea. did you feel the aura to players? No, I never felt it. No, I never felt it. I'm just they saying, players it. say that all the time. I mean, this is what you're saying is a, a theme I've heard from, from players in general that I wasn't easy to talk to, and that's a flaw in my coaching. And that club made history. The, the, yeah. the three-peat was something else, wasn't it? Well, just amazing. I mean, we. Uh, but you asked, did, when did I know we were going to win that? That was pretty late in the, in the 2001 2000. grand final. But, I mean, really, the greatest thing, really, was the, the 20-game win streak. I mean, from round 10 of 2001 to round four or five of 
the following year. They, they won the fit, net the last 16 of 01 and then the first four of the following year. So just, I mean, there's a basic stat in footy. If you're in it a long time, you lose every third week. <laughs> it never gets any better than no one, I know Jock Hale's probably got a winning percentage of in the 60s. That's as good as it gets. So the fact that we didn't have to suffer losing for 20, 20 weeks in that period of time was quite remarkable. Well, uh, let's have a look at the tw 2001 grand final. So the moment has arrived. Haven't we been waiting? The first bounce on grand final day. Early kick for him would be important, I think. Finds power at half-back, almost up the centre wing. Powers kick to half forward. Brown at the back. Just got rid of Solomon. Jacobs to get back. Handball to Carousel on his hands and knees. Hart oh. it off. Goes for goal. No. Comes out wide and finds Lynch. Oh. Surely Fletch has decked him unceremoniously. Well, it was a magnificent intercept by Sean Hart. Carousel went to ground. He got a piece of slippery turf and he was put under some pressure. Here's the free kick being given away. Not a lot of doubt in that one. Won't be much criticism on the umpire for paying an early free kick for this in front of goal. And I do think, Jerry, if you're going to give one away, make it a decent one. He got away with a fair bit there, Dustin Fletcher, didn't he? That's certainly given him something to think about. There's a bit behind play. Brad Scott and uh, James Hurt. Trying to get up uh, Hurt a bit there. Lynch, has he missed it? It's coming back. I think he's missed it. It's close. He has. Up and under. It'll be play on. Hasn't gone far. Not paid, surely. Umpire was very clear in saying play on. And well, he's pulled a free kick out. Free kick, yeah. yeah. Is it to Lynch? It's for a high contact, I think, on Ellis to Lynch. So he, he didn't pay the mark because the, the ball obviously didn't travel the required 10 metres. It was a great attack, a great physical attack on the ball by Ellis to Lynch. You'll see him come sailing over the top and really grab the ball. But then have a look as the players pile in on top. Someone in there. There's a. Uh, a bit of grabbing around the head, I think. Might have been a soft one, but a chance for Alistair Lynch to atone for that first miss. Well, this is an easier shot. He really shouldn't miss. Should kick the first goal of the grand final. He has. Scott bangs it to about 40 metres. Powers in a good position. Yes. He's in a great position, and he's taken the mark. He read it best. He was the smallest of the four. But you could see from the moment the ball was in the area that he was the chance. Now, he's normally a great finisher. Well, the forward line working wonders for Brisbane. I think uh, problems at the other end. They've got to just get a different chemistry around there. They're too big. They've perhaps got to get Barnes off the ground and Alessio into the ruck. McCurry looks as if he's coming onto the yeah, ground. Yeah, spot on, Jared. Uh, both uh, changes here. McDonald, Dukitian and Barnes and McCurry. Now it's kicks good. He's got it. But now the Lions with an early 15-point break. They've had the bulk of the attacking. This time Hurd gets a touch, much to the delight of Bomber fans. Down towards Lucas, who marks inside 50. They just look too big, Jason, initially. Well, it's an interesting matchup. Chris Scott is giving away a lot of height to uh, Scotty Lucas. But isn't it great to see James Hurd just injecting himself into the game and immediately something happens for the Bombers. I think the one thing Chris Scott has to do is certainly not give away front position. He's going to find it very difficult if he decides to play from behind. Scotty Lucas, one of only two Bombers to have played every game this season. The other one being Ramanauskas. Directly in front. 57 goals last year. 31 so far this year. Lucas from 49 for the Bombers first. And he doesn't let the Red and Black Army down. He's got Rioli now. Dean Rioli will give a little round. And he does as the diving mark is taken by Johnson. Just 25 metres out almost directly in front. 20 goals for the season. Can he continue to erode the Brisbane Lions early lead? He can. Maybe Lloyd will get an opportunity now. Yes. No, he won't. Because he's taken the mark directly in front. And he's only 25 metres out. Well, I think that's the one he wanted. He needed to inject himself in, take a strong mark under pressure. The back-to-back -back Centurion. Closing in on Simon Madden's club record. He shoots for his first for the day. And he gets it. Solomon going back. Voss off the ground. Akamanis left foot. Oh, it's brilliant. a goal. Brilliant. He's done it. The brown line medalist has put him in front. <laughs> they need 
Sweet as some magic from somewhere. And who better to supply it? Well, when he got his hands on the ball, didn't he accelerate? But I thought he was running himself into a tighter angle. But that trusty left foot, we've seen it on a couple of occasions this year. Kick goals on the run from 60 metres this time. He threads the needle from an almost impossible angle. He but, makes a difference, doesn't he? Oh, he, he certainly does. Just have a look at this. I mean, it was willing. People putting their bodies on the line. Voss tried to get it off the deck. He takes off there, actually runs further away. And a magnificent snap over the shoulder. Danger here. Johnson tries to pop it over the top. Doesn't quite succeed. Lucas, he's in a good spot for the left footer. Lucas, pick it Scotty Lucas is having a fairly big say on this day. He decides to head to the open spaces. He'll certainly test Heard. Brad Scott is there with him. Scott turns him inside out, and he's away. He's been in very good form. Oh, great kick. Lovely kick in towards Brown. And Jonathan Brown, the 19-year-old from South Warrnambool, will go back and have a shot. Well, what a pivotal moment that was. A one-on-one -on -one battle. Won by Brad Scott decisively. And once again, it was the feet that went on the on uh, James Hurd this time. We've seen a number of the Bomber players, more so than Brisbane, going to ground, slipping on the turf. Jonathan Brown. His father played with Fitzroy Bryan in the late 70s. Akamanis back on the ground. Nigel Lappin, the man that is having a spell. Tough shot. For Jonathan Brown, distance not a problem. The accuracy in that pocket will certainly test him. He's a right footer. It's a lovely kick. A delightful kick and back come the Lions. He's one of the few players in the cop to give any chance at all. He's timed it sweetly. It's a good kick. It's going and going. Oh, they it. like it. He's drilled it. Barnes, he says, how about that? In the pocket is Black. Needs to get clear. He bounces up beautifully. Flicks Great it off kick. the right boot and finds Alistair Link. And maybe, well, it could well be one of the last kicks of the quarter, but he's got a chance to peg it back. Great effort by Simon. Black hasn't had much impact, as we said, in this term. Had a reasonable start. But this is a uh, superb piece of play. Second effort was brilliant, but it's a must goal for Alistair Lynch. It's his fifth shot for goal. He's kicked one goal, three so far. 20 points the margin at the moment. Lynch has finally broken through after those uh, three behinds. He's got his second. Combining now with Ashcroft, the 268 game veteran. Can he go all the way from 51 metres? Over the top he goes! That's the one they needed. The Lions are still alive. The kick's got to be good. The bounce is a good one. Eventually for Brown. Down he goes. Up he comes. Gives it to power. And the Lions are still there. Hips through and pops it on the left foot towards Lloyd. Big take away from Rob, and this is a big kick. They managed just a couple of behinds for the quarter. The Lions had somewhat of a drought. Akamanis is leaving the ground from McRae as Lloyd sets sail for home from 49 metres. The century goal kicker has steadied the Essendon ship and he's kicked his turn. So Jason Johnson still there warming up, but Voss tries to go through. Can't quite. The handball to Lapham was good. The left foot's not bad. Oh. Oh, it's terrific. It's a goal from nowhere. The Lions are running. He goes in towards Brown. Jonathan Brown is in the pocket. We'll go back now and shoot for goal. And this will be a kick to give the Lions the lead. Brown for his second. The youngest player on the ground. This to give the Lions the lead. He has done it. He has given them the lead. Again, they go towards full forward, towards a Oh, it's a mark. He hasn't paid. Keeping, not paid. Well, they go on, so Pike decides he will kick the goal. Catch us now, say the Lions. Start of the last quarter in so many ways. Barnes and McDonald, McDonald out of the air. Still McDonald to Voss in the pocket. Voss close. He's done it. Has he? The captain. He's finished it off. And again in the grand final, they're delivered. Akamanis to power. Power for a third. Another one. This would be the icing on the cake. Starts at left. Back comes and he kicks the goal. 
He's had seven marks, ten possessions, kicked two goals for it. They've done it. He's got the ball in his hands, Bruce. A bit of history here. Lee Matthews has been to the top of the mountain for a second time as coach. Once at Collingwood, and now he's done the impossible. Brisbane have won the Premiership. Premiership Cup to Michael Voss and Lee Matthews, the Brisbane Lions. Anything for you. Tennis, Lee had to be the, to win all the time. What if he didn't? He cheated. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did it. You're for saying it. <laughs> when he was You're little. saying that. <laughs> well, he did too. I've told the grandchildren about him. Lee, mums say the darndest things. Yeah, thanks, mum, for that one. It was probably true, though. That probably, in one sentence, unfortunately, in some ways, summarise my attitude to competition, really. I mean, people ask me to talk about leadership and winning. They don't ask me to talk about the morality of competition because I'm not too good at that. That bit of film in that interview we did is the only footage you've got of your mum and dad? Yeah, it is. And I, and I wrote my, given it to my brothers. It is, yeah, it's the only footage I've got of, they were very elderly, obviously, but it was, uh, yeah, that was the only footage I've got of mum and dad. In your life, what do you think's been the most meaningful thing you've done? Uh, Oh, I haven't done anything terribly meaningful because my life has been fairly much based around sport. I mean, as I said, sports, you're kind of to little... I guess it's entertainment. You, you, can, you might argue you've entertained a lot of people. That's about the best you can say. But in terms of what some people do with their lives, uh, no, I'm pretty small potatoes in that category, I think. What's been the most meaningful experience? I, I know you, you walked Kokoda yeah. in 2006. Yeah. Is that yeah. up there? I'm a goal-orientated person. The only thing a part of Kokoda I enjoyed was walking over the finish <laughs> because it was five days of agony. Uh, uh, I hope, prior to hope that. you didn't knock yeah. over any fuzzy wazzies yeah, on the way yeah, or anything. That, that's right, yeah. No, but I did, um, well, no, not in me, the things that you remember. I mean, strangely, I, I coached the international rules team when they started that international rules against Ireland at the end yeah. of 98 before I went to Brisbane. And we, and we won the first test over there, and at the time, it was like winning the grand final. Now, People back in Australia don't really care about what's going on in the international rules, but having the coat of arms on your unit, on your outfit, and singing the national anthem like a theme song at the end after the win yeah. was an enormous buzz. So I've had a lot of those moments. So uh, that's really, really gratifying. But uh, no, I'd like to say I gave more to the world, but probably didn't. You said at the start of the interview um, some stuff about how you've changed. You used to be motivated in your playing days, I think, by the fear of failure. Yeah. You've yeah. told me that. Yeah, that, that was my whole life. I mean, I, I kind of, uh, good or bad, I can almost can see the downside in everything. Um, but Are you more half glass, half full now, these yeah, days? Yeah, no, I don't think I've altered in that regard. I mean, I don't think I was any different at the Brisbane Lions in 2008 than I was as a 17-year-old at Hawthorne in 1969. That, that, the, the fear of failure is, is, is what drove me, but... That yep. doesn't matter much. As long as you accept the challenge, it doesn't matter whether it's the, it's the, you know, the joy of winning or the fear of failure that drives you. But the problem is, if you've got a real bad feel of failure, you, sometimes just you're not prepared to accept the challenge. Some of us fail a lot too. That's, that's we all a fail problem. a lot. <laughs> we all fail a lot. As I say, I, I, I think my, uh, over my lifetime of 800 games, still lost about 300 times. <laughs> oh, don't whinge, Lee, don't whinge. Uh, Are you, you're a sunny person, though, these days, aren't you? Yeah, well, I'm sort of I'm me again. When, when, I, when I played and when I coached, I, I always feel I'm a bit of a chameleon, that I kind of think, well, this is what I've got to do to succeed in this environment. Mm. You have and, to take on the coach's yeah, persona. Yeah, I've got to take on the coach. Well, what I think yeah. the coach's persona is yeah. now, I'm, whatever that is. I mean, whatever yeah. you think it is, you take it on. Um, but now, without that cloak, uh, whatever I am, I think's me. Yeah. yeah. Now, are you a hawk, a, a pie, or a, or yeah. a lion? Or well, a, that, I, a member of the people, fifth estate. People thought, well, I remember the fifth estate, but it's more the point is because I was heavily involved with three clubs, I find my Barricka fan has really been diluted. <laughs> I often think that probably in a way the club you played for, like in ten years' time, it's more the it's more that Hawthorne probably uh, what's the word? Except me as one of those because I played there. 
coaching is very much an off-field role and coaching is just king is dead, long live the king. As soon as you walk out the door and there's a new coach sitting in your office, all you were was another off-field person who helped out. Whereas players, the, the, the players out on the field, everyone sees, you know, you're in the, the brown and gold jumper and so. But the answer to that question is, I don't vote for anybody. Uh, I'd like to vote for one club, to be honest, but I don't have that mentality I'm, to any of the three clubs that I've been involved in. My favourite Lee Matthews story would have to be Justin Left <laughs> in the lift after the grand final. Well, that one's true too, this one's true. Now this was probably after 2003 and uh, after probably uh, grand final day is the one day you're kind of almost drinking. So about eight o'clock at night, we're going up to the function. That, I hope to always say, this is about after eight, eight crown lagers, Neil. <laughs> and uh, Leff was being cheeky in, in the lift said, uh, geez, where would you be without us? They said, mate, all I'd be is player of the century. <laughs> so that was a true story, but it was, you know, like you've got to sort of say there was a lot of alcohol involved in both of us and we were all just having fun with each other. Lee, I reckon it's a beautiful place to finish. You're only the player of the century. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you. What an amazing career. I hope you've enjoyed reliving it as much as I have. That's the show this week. We'll be back again soon to take another walk down memory lane next time on Footy Flashbacks.